mean I'm honored to have Shannon Breen from Freyvana here with me. Um, this part might get cut out, but I want you guys to know that we have a huge blooper today, given this is the first live episode we've done. And um, the LinkedIn Live got disconnected from a live stream, and Shannon has been a great sport from sticking with me, encouraging me for the last 22 minutes. 22 minutes nonstop. I did not hear a single rant from Shannon. And thank you so much, Shannon, for just being such a good pal and so supportive. Um, and I cannot thank you enough for, for being here today in the first place, but also just being such a supportive friend. Hey, man. Uh, what I tell you, nothing ventured, nothing gained, right? And uh, I think part of my journey and just professional journey and what I've been on, like, look, you're going to make a ton of mistakes and you're going to stumble, but, but look, you're, you're, you're on a cool path, you're doing cool things. And at the end of the day, like a, a LinkedIn post or a, a stream app debacle is, is not gonna set you back. And in the grand scheme of things, my man, it's a very, very small, very small issue to, to overcome, so. Thank you, sir. Um, but yeah, super excited to dive into it today with you and um, be able to listen to your story and hear yeah. about you know your vision for, for Fre Frevana. So many questions for you, but uh, maybe as a start, I uh, would love to just hear about, you know, kind of your backstory in terms of uh, what brought you into the freight industry and what was your life, you know, before the freight industry looking like? Uh, give us give us the origin story of Shannon Breen. The origin story. I started as a young boy in the, in a, the southern Oregon, uh, growing up on five acres in the middle of the woods. All true. Uh, my parents were school teachers, Kevin. So we, you know, moved to Phoenix in 1990. And, and really have been here ever since and enjoy the heck out of Phoenix. Uh, went to ASU locally, uh, high school here, friends here, family here. So uh, Arizona's home for me um, and kind of always put our roots down. So a background in finance, always had an entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, and I started working in the transportation industry in 2012. I transitioned over to night transportation uh, and worked uh, honestly in, in what was at that point just a kind of early stage brokerage that, that the night team had stood up and, and, and a lot of work to be done as far as integrations and technology and just overall strategy. And so I learned the business while, while trying to kind of work my way through, um, you know, the, the corporate side of things and just figure things out as we go. But that was kind of my first foray into transportation was 2012. So uh, I am officially over a decade uh, in the game. Uh, and I obviously love it and uh, I love new participants of it, which is honestly why like your energy, your passion, just the little that, you know, we've known each other. Um, maybe really excited to kind of hear your story, too, and be a part of this journey that you're trying to take, Kevin. I'm definitely honored to be able to have met you and, and you know, just learn about your vision and your story and excited to dive into uh, and pretty, really obviously really appreciate your encouragement so far. But I think today. Um, obviously you're the spotlight and in addition to Freyvana, I think another really interesting piece of your story is how you really just grew with nice Swift, which is one of the largest carriers in the country and also saw the merger that happened. If I remember correctly, back in 2017 between Knight and Swift. Um, and I think another thing is, uh, for those of you that are listening, but not familiar, Shannon actually managed two of the three main business units, not just one, but two of the three main business units at Night Swift. When I read that on your LinkedIn profile, to be honest with you, I actually had to do a double take to make sure I actually read that correctly. So excited to dive into a, a, to that bit more, but can you just, you know, maybe start off, tell us about what did you work on at Nice Swift and what was that experience like? Yeah, I think going back early stage, right? We were doing brokerage on green screens. For everybody familiar, we were doing our brokerage services off of the AS400. I'm sure everybody's seen the green screens. That is the AS400, uh, incredibly sub-optimized, let's say, compared to the, the competition that over the last 10, 15 years had built their own technologies. So, so I was a part of a, a small group and helped lead kind of the charge of transitioning to our first web-based product there. Um, we knew we needed it in order to compete and in order to scale. So worked on that heavily, uh, worked a little bit on the account and sales side, just with overall strategic approaches, right, in order to build a logistics organization. And then you alluded to Kevin, right? The merger in 2017. So, uh, what a what a great experience! One of the largest mergers in transportation, uh, especially in the U.S., especially from a truckload perspective. Um, and I got to sit at the forefront of that, like really gracious uh, for that opportunity. From a learning perspective, nothing like uh, what we went through in 17. Just combined brands and 
uh, not even combining the brands, but really figuring out like where truly, you know, the word synergy gets used all the time in mergers, but really triggered for trying to figure out what those synergies were, making hard decisions, transitioning business, um, was just a was just a learning of a lifetime in regards to having a little bit of transportation experience and then getting my first mega like uh, uh, merger experience. Man, it was it was it was something that I always lean back on uh, from a learning perspective, and so I'm so so grateful and gracious I got to go through that because taught me a lot about myself, taught me a lot about uh, business even more than I knew. Um, lessons learned that you carry on into into different avenues of life, maybe like a startup, maybe like a Freyvana. Right. And so it just builds you in a different way. It's it's uh, uh, like I said, it was an awesome experience to go through and and then took on the responsibilities that you mentioned. Right. Intermodal um, came on after logistics, uh, both both kind of working on solving similar problems. Right. Efficiencies and profitability and figuring out how to scale and go to market strategies and just aligning teams and getting buy-in from overall organizations, uh, especially a large organization like a Knight Swift. And so um, all great things that came out of that, which kind of led me to uh, January of last year when, when John and I both decided to take the big leap, uh, hang a brand new banner in the space, test our test our skills and abilities in new ways, and 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 hence Freightvana was born. So. Before we dive into Freyvana, I'm really curious, looking back at, at your nice with experience, and, and, and I think for someone like yourself, um, you know, g- managing two business units, logis- logistics and intermodal at the same time, I'm curious, what were some of, mo- some of the most memorable lessons that you had from that experience, whether it is maybe a potential initiative, uh, a specific initiative that you worked on or, or various projects, but I'm curious, like, what are some of the most fond memories that you had with, you know, your 10 your, I guess, like nine years with Night Swift. Yeah, just managing a business at that scale, right? I think when you see the amount of moves, I mean, I, I, I probably won't accurately state it, but you got to realize within that org, especially after a merger, you're working for a company that's moving 60,000 shipments a week, right? And then you see it happen at a big scale. And then I think there's two things that happen at that scale. One, there's like this all factor, and like, how does it all get done? And there's this other side of the coin, honestly, Kevin, which is like, you're kind of surprised how it gets done because of maybe some uh, inefficiencies in systems or alignments or interdepartment uh, relationships. And so it's kind of this weird dichotomy of like, wow, it's really fantastic. And then there's times where you're scratching your head, like, I'm not sure how all this works at scale, right? Like, like right. it's, it's like, in- I think for, for us, you know, from the outside, we, we all know that, you know, nice was huge. And, and, you know, like yeah. you mentioned like 6,000 loads and like per, per month, per week. Per week. weeks, I'm sorry, per week. Yeah. And I guess like what were, if we were to pull back the curtain a little bit, just just a little bit, you know, with what you can share, and here's like, what are some things that really surprise you? You know, kind of like standing from your viewpoint, looking into a nice web, what were some things that you found really surprising that you feel that you yeah, feel like? I that- think the most intriguing thing I'll share, and then go back to maybe an entrepreneurial spirit. I even had a small company and like my, I don't want to date myself too much on, on your podcast here, but going back to my 20s, which was a long time ago, I had like a small business and, and really took a shot at some entrepreneurship in the real estate and, and some other spaces. Um, the thing that shocked me the most and the learning lesson, the biggest was at scale, a lot of things actually became easier too, right? Because you had momentum and you had flexibility. And like, I was always used to kind of like from an entrepreneurial perspective, these small businesses, if you're always on the razor's edge. You go to a big company with that much resources, that much stability, some of the stuff actually gets taken away. So while there's new, new, new challenges that you've got to uh, work on, it's so much different than a small company in that like every decision is like life or death. It's really not life or death, right? Because you've created such a, and kudos to the founders and the leadership teams that have created that bandwidth to be like, hey, you can make mistakes. Um, so, that, so that's kind of the piece that's the huge takeaway from working for a big company is like, it's actually easier at scale. And then I had done, you know, so much work as far as building a really qualified team and having the appropriate levels. So honestly, you're not like in an entrepreneurial state or when you're a small business or a growing business, like there's so many things to carry, but in an established business, as long as you've got the right leadership, the right construct, everybody's carrying like an equal amount of weight. So it, it actually wasn't as challenging as maybe I would have thought, like when you think about the size and the enormity of it, if that makes sense. 
Interesting. So is the resources that, you know, that is given you by such a large organization actually makes your job slightly easier. And then I think the next part is actually the what we are here for, you know, for Ivana and the next chapter for Shannon Breen. Um, I think the very first question I have off the bat is why, why, why start a company? I, I think you are already at a amazing career trajectory at Nice Whip, managing yeah. two of the three main business units. Why? why? Why do you do it? Yeah, hey, I think I think a couple of things, right? On a on a personal level, I think it, it ties back to just ambitions and goals. And you know, I've been in the space a long time and kind of learned the space. And I think it it, it kind of left me wondering, like, hey, how could I compete on my own? Right? I think that entrepreneurial spirit was always sitting there, which is why I was probably successful or had some levels of success in my prior role. But I still think there was this burning desire to maybe be able to really challenge yourself in my ultimate way, like hang a brand new banner and do it in a hyper competitive space against titans of industry that are well funded and be like, hey, like, I, I guess maybe I, I, I cater to this, Kevin, like I've always been more of the underdog type of person, right? And so right, wrong or indifferent when you're working for a night swift, it, 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 it does have this presence of we're already there, we're already successful, we already, when you compare ourselves with others, are quote unquote better. I don't want to use the word entitled, but it kind of comes off that way, right? Like you've already arrived, right? So it all makes sense. And so for me, I guess being the kid that was undersized, under talented, probably not as smart as everybody, definitely not as fast or as strong as everybody on the sports fields. Like for me, what I identify with is that underdog mentality. And so I, I embrace that in my, my journey and my growth at Night Swift. And once I got to a certain point, I realized, like, I felt like, you know what, I still need to go kind of, you know, kind of lean into that some more and figure out, like, how can I do something even more underdog than that? Right. And I think a part of it, too, like, can you, you know, that's the ultimate test, right? Betting on yourself, um, much like you're doing, um, putting all the chips in the middle. Um, and I think the other thing is, you know, I mentioned my parents being school teachers, right? I'm not, I didn't grow up with, uh, money being at the forefront. Like I would say I grew up more with like competition being at the forefront of what drives me. And so at a certain point, if you're already super successful and you're already this and like the difference between winning is, Hey, we didn't make 150 million in this quarter. We, our company made 250. I don't, I don't know. Right. Like we, hey, we didn't win by 20 points. We won by 30. Like I kind of like to be the one that's like, Hey, I'm down by 10 or, Hey, this team smacked us last time. Like, what can we do to win next time? Like, that's what drives me more. So I think startup life was just the path that I, I needed to run and, uh, in order to really have that level of fulfillment and, and look back. Um, and on a personal level, right. I think we all go through it. Uh, you know, some sickness in the family and some folks going through some stuff and COVID happened and just that time to assess. And I think you start thinking about your legacy and what you want to accomplish and what you'll be most proud of. And I just felt like I needed to do this to be able to look back and have have hashtag no regrets on a journey uh, and know that that I took all the bets um, and, and, you know, right, you know, see where the chips fall. But, but I'm OK with that. I'm a huge believer in terms of if you have an itch, you got to go scratch it. You got to go scratch that itch. Otherwise, you're going to be regretting it. You're going to be kicking yourself. And I think, you know, that's the worst thing you can do for yourself. And I think, you know, having that issue and, and be able to confront it, even though, you know, you have, you know, you have a lot to lose. Statistically, we are doing something crazy here. We're doing something that we know is not going to work out. But I think being able to, you know, like say goodbye to the comfort to, you know, to like, I guess, like the privilege that we, ha you know, that you previously had with yeah. Nice Cliff. I think, I think that's, you know, that's a huge stamp of, um, um, I guess like courage, you know, in, in terms of like that you being able to dive into this. And I, I have a lot of respect for that. I, I think the follow up question is how do you, I think another thing, you know, looking at, looking at you, looking at Freibana, it's also the team that you have put together, which is quite impressive for, you know, a company at your stage. How did you convince those people to follow this crazy idea that you have? Give me the secret <laughs> sauce. Uh, well, I'm glad that we both agree it's a crazy idea. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I would say this, I think the way that I showed up for those teams, those people that I knew, the people I worked alongside for hopefully a decade, I think hopefully gave them a sense of what I was about. Um, I think authenticity is really important, probably the most important thing in leadership. 
Um, I think sometimes at a large corporation that gets diluted. Um, and I think that when these people saw a path to build potentially something special, um, hopefully I, I instilled in them a level of confidence. Uh, and we've seen what we accomplished kind of in our times together in our 10 years uh, in, in that other location. And they looked at it as an opportunity that they didn't want to miss out to challenge themselves, right? Uh, to be have multiple roles, wear multiple hats, have multiple questions, but at the end of the day, you know, really have a, a, an ownership type mentality and be like, hey, can we build something once again, that underdog against the world? Um, and I think it's just trust, right? So it's in, it's in our slogan, right? Uh, transparency, trust, technology. But I think that trust, as important as it is externally, internally, you'll see a team here when people visit, they're like, wow, that's, that's a little different. And I think part of that is a lot of us, the core group of folks that came over, like we, we know, we've known each other a long time. We know what we're about. We fight like family. We love like family. Um, and, and we're willing to kind of be in the trench together in this professional life that we all want to chase something that we don't know what it is, but we're all excited to go figure it out together. Love that. Um, on, on, this, on the topic of transparency, I think that's, you know, one of the things that we chat about when we had our one on one. But yeah. um, I think, you know, from my limited time in the freight industry, I think one of the things that I really noticed uh, is the lack of transparency and trust in, in freight. Um, obviously, I think broker is a very easy target. Uh, um, and, and I think building a digital broker yourself, I think you probably know that as well. Um, but how I'm curious like, to get your perspective on how Freightvana is currently tackling the lack of transparency and trust in the freight industry. And what are you guys doing differently to build that trust between brokers and carriers and as well as the shippers? Yeah, I think I think we, obviously multifaceted question and approach there. Right. But I think for us, um, firstly, with the carriers, right, you work a lot with the carriers. I think that's where you and I identified in our for kind of first cover conversations. You know, if you just gave a, a scorecard or, or, or a quiz to, let's say, carriers and asked them, what's their level of trust with brokers? on a one to 10, what number would you put out there? And you can use decimals too. Like just, what do you think that would be? A trust score, one to 10. Um, obviously the answer varies from, bro uh, very, very from brokers to broker, but I would say, given my experience, I think we'll probably be consistently like a two or three. And that's what I would say, right? I would have said two point something. And I think there's a reason why. I think it's the way that the business is interacted. I think it is the lack of real transparency Right. I think some people are out there like, hey, we're all about transparency. I'm like, because you're publicly traded and post your results or like which part of transparency are you living? Right. And so um, I agree. I think there's a fundamental break in the way carriers see um, brokers in general. And hey, I was a part of that in some of my career, too. Right. Like we would we would make promises to carriers and then the market would shift and we had thousands of trucks that needed to move and we'd need to, Hey, I'm sorry. Like, you know, we needed to disappoint people because we had a prioritization loop at America's biggest trucker, which was to keep the trucks moving, which you totally understand. And, and, and it's part of the kind of part of the, the, the team game plan there. But unfortunately for those carriers on the back end that get those conversations and get that disappointment, what, what are we? We're just another untrustworthy broker, right? And I think that lack of trust, Kevin, much like a personal relationship, right? As soon as you introduce a lack of trust, what happens? It just it just starts to erode on both sides. So then they act a certain. So then carriers feel like they need to act a certain way, and then the broker acts a certain way, and then the shippers. And so the way that the brokers, carriers, and shippers interact, it doesn't really benefit anybody. But in order to really change the game, you've got to show up differently. And so through our technology package. Um, through our contracts, like we do different types of deals um, and are very open book on how we do those deals. And what we've been able to do is attract those carriers that want something different. We've been able to attract those shippers that are looking to invest in something different for the mid to long term. Um, and that's really the special piece of Freyvana that's not so born in transactional, opportunistic, taking advantage of the volatility in a market which that's pretty much what every broker is built on doing. Right. right. Um, and people always say, Oh, they take advantage of the high. Well, they do in revenues and profits and clearly those escalate, but they even take advantage of the declining markets, much like it's happening now. And the 
typically the people on the downside of that are usually either the carrier shipper, depending what it is. And the broker, as the, the biggest brokers in the country have taught us, they always figure out their piece in the middle. And you've got two people on the other side that are like constantly feeling like it's a boxing match and one's getting <laughs> beat up more than the other. Right. And so it's like, hey, how do we level that playing field? How do we create fair deals? How do we show up in a unique fashion compared to other brokers? Um, how do we deploy tech against it to hold everybody accountable as we go through this process together? And that's kind of where uh, our mindset lies. That's where our growth has 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 been born. And and honestly, even our big partnerships like the one with Wabash, right? Like that is born out of a very um, pure uh conversations like-minded desires and passions similar cultural approach and so you know for a lot of people they're like that doesn't make sense to me i'm like it makes perfect sense like we're trying to solve a problem we need partners to do it and we're going to show up in a non-opportunistic way to see hey in years to come can we solve the problems with different relationships that aren't just capitally minded it's not just based on our valuation it's based on solution design and so that's where we've, we've really hung our hat um above like the capital build and the capital burn um or the the investment in maybe loss leading type business just to open the door with the shipper like that, that that's just not what our interest level is can we can we can we talk about the the approach the asset based approach that freyvana has taken i think this is probably by far the most interesting part about your business model is I think most brokers probably shy away from, you know, like buying assets, I, you know, for, for very obvious yeah. reasons, but, but why, why doing it and, and why doing it at the scale that you guys are doing it? Uh, and obviously, you know, the, the partnership with Wabash is uh, like very, very interesting. I'm curious, like how that has like affected your overall strategy. Um, but yeah, please tell, please tell us more about, you know, kind of like the asset based approach that Freyvana is taking and where do you yeah. see that going? And hey, we'd have to go back to the Knight Swift conversation, right? We didn't really have a formalized power only program at Knight Swift you know, going back four or five years, we'd do some of it, but it was ad hoc. It was transactional. It wasn't formalized. And so I led an entire team of technologists and operators and um, really organized the organization to be able to really build the, 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 the constructs of what would be and is today, like the Knight Swift power only solution. And so I think going back to the why, well, I got to kind of see it from its gestation period, right? Three, four years ago, got to see the moving parts, the positives, the negatives, um, got to really understand it. And then, so when we wanted to set up to really differentiate Freyvana, we knew that assets were important. They're incredibly expensive. They're incredibly hard to manage, but I've also got a team that doesn't shy away from that because of our experience working for one of the largest asset-based companies in the country. And so when you kind of marry those two ideas and then you go get strategic partnerships like the ones we have, we felt like, hey, what an amazing combination to to run at, offer to the market. Um, and I think part of it is true just being different too, Kevin, right? Like I really like like challenging the paradigm, challenging status quos. And I felt like another reason for Freyvana was there was just a lot of commentary on, hey, we're all going to democratize freight. My algorithm's better than yours. Look at my automation. I'm digitally freight matching, even though I'm just digitally rate matching. Like all this commentary left a lot to be desired. So I'm like, what if we can do all this stuff and show up with some skin in the game? Like, I think that's a business that'll be formidable, not for just an up market, but for many markets in the future. And that, and that's why John and I were, were, went so hard at, at, at the investments and the team and, and making sure we had everything in place to make this type of a, an aggressive growth run that we're on. How has how has the power only you know like program that you guys are uh, uh, spearheading? How has that been received by the carriers that you guys bring partnering with? Carriers absolutely love it, right? I think it, it it obviously deflects one of their larger costs, which is the equipment. I think on the the big side of the piece, and we all know the long tail of the small carriers. You work with a lot of them, and some of the work you do, Kevin. Um, it really opens them up to opportunities with shippers that they otherwise left to themselves wouldn't have albeit a random spot load with an, a live load appointment. But, but, but let's be honest, the largest, biggest, baddest shippers in the country, they need trailer pools. They want homogeneous trailer pools and they're not looking to set up onesie twosie carriers to come in and drop one trailer for one load on a Tuesday, right? They're looking for something uh, with scale. And so we're kind of marrying that idea of a large asset based company but giving the benefit to the small, medium-sized carriers that left to themselves wouldn't have that access. So, so that in itself is a very special approach. 
if you do it at scale like we're doing and if you kind of provide the tech packages and everything that we're, we're, we're providing uh, the market, our shippers and our carriers on, on the freight on X deployments that we make. So. Absolutely. How do you, I guess, like, you know, obviously there are other um, uh, brokers, uh, for example, Uber Freight, Convoy, also offering similar programs. I'm curious, how do you see, you know, Freyvana, obviously a relatively newer entrant, being able to stand out, you know, against some of these, like, you know, existing players in the game? Yeah, I think it's focus, right? It's focus, ambition. Um, both of those institutions are great in their own rights, but they've got a lot of moving parts, right? Like they've got a lot of different initiatives. And I would tell you that owning assets is a different deal, especially if you want to be a tech company, right? If you want a tech multiple, you don't go pick up capital assets. That actually works against you. And so there's a con natural confliction in that. Like, oh, are you a platform? Or are you a, a an asset-based company? And so as people work through that, especially in a trying market, I think what people are going to shy more away from is, capital assets, large investments, tough to carry, tough to manage, um, tough to keep on the road and, and doesn't work well in a no touch digital platform environment. So you see that natural confliction that gets created. And so uh, in that, I think if we stay hyper-focused, we use our experiences, we show up in a certain way. I think there is a path for us, um, albeit a challenging one, Right. Like mar this market is not not great. Right. Tender acceptance is super high. How many people are looking for uh, for new providers? Like there's plenty of challenges in any market, but I just really love our path and our plan. And, and, and I think we're realistic in what we think we can accomplish three, five, seven, ten years down the road. And, and that's what we're shooting for more than a, a short, uh, short term kind of flash in the pan. People ask me all the time, like, oh, you just want to get your valuation and, and and what retire? I'm like, no, I want to, I want to build an amazing brand, a private brand, one that people love working at To your point. The team loves coming to supporting all the families that come here, have a cool culture where we support one another. Um, a lot of things that are obligatory to say, but very rarely companies can actually pull off. Right. And I think that's that level of like, yeah, well, you're going to hear all the same stuff you hear from anybody else from any company. But what's real and what's not, and I think that authenticity, going back to that, is what sets us apart. Can we talk about that too? I think one of the things, you know, I, again, like I, I always go back to our first conversation, but I just remember coming across, I think people on LinkedIn with the yellow and black, you know, like branding from Freyvana, that stood out to me right away. I was like, I got to talk to these people, and talk, talk to, talk to me about, you know, like how, why is Freyvana taking such like a unique content-led strategy with, you know, like brand building and also team building and, you know, with like many like Josh, Joshua, for example, you know, like a very, very active, uh, you know, commu commu uh, company community member. Um, I like that you call him Joshua too. That's like formal. That's really cool. Joshua, he'll appreciate Josh, that. <laughs> Joshua, if you're listening to this, great job. <laughs> he's got a day off. His little girl turned six, so he's enjoying some family time, but he, he would definitely pay attention and, and, and I'll let him know for sure too. Tell, Yeah. Um, but please tell us about, you know, how has the content list strategy been for, for you, you know, and your team in terms of like company building? I think that is something I would say quite unique, you know, with your strategy so far. I think that's another like very big differentiator for, for free bonus. So we'll love to dive in more. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say absolute passion for marketing. I've told many people this, like, you know, low key, like I love marketing, right? Like I'm the guy that watches commercials and like dissects them in my head and, evaluates whether I liked them or didn't like them. So I've always had this passion for marketing. Josh, very similarly, um, I think working at a larger publicly traded institution, um, there's a little bit different level of empowerment and uh, uh, control that's implied there. And, and you don't get to kind of live out your uh, marketing ambitions the way you would like. Uh, so much more challenging. So when we got a chance to stand up the new brand, it was kind of like, hey, we can do anything we want. And that's a exciting thing. That can be a scary thing. Um, but I think knowing the team we had, knowing what we wanted to do, we kind of just led off with, hey, you're all pros. We appreciate you. We're all here to do something special. Like everybody's going to have their own voice and style. The other thing is like social media is amazing in, in regards to brand awareness and getting your name out there, right? You, you found us on LinkedIn, right? We didn't, you and I didn't know each other. No one referred you to me. I didn't get referred to you. Like, so think about it, like you heard about Freight Vana through that. Our ship, some shippers have heard about it. And if they haven't heard about it, here's what's cool. 
when we're having conversations and they don't know, and then they go do their research, now there's content and stuff out there that they can look at and they see how we interact. They see how we interact, they see our team interacts, and now they feel like they know us even though we've only met maybe for a few minutes. And so there's a magic to it, there's a science to it, but I think more importantly, it's just it, the word empowerment is really important because I see a lot of people want to accomplish it, but then they're not willing to relinquish the reins on it, right? It's very kept tight and like only a certain amount of people. And so it becomes more corporate led than team led. And we've just had a team led approach. I'm just one member on the team. I'm not even very good at it. We've got plenty of people that are much better at it, which is great. It's awesome, right? Because then they get their own following, their own people. And the whole time, right, we're just representing, hey, you want to work with a cool team? Like, give us a call. We'd, we'd love to work with you in a very hyper competitive space. But that's where it's been our advantage. That was part of our strategy and, and honestly, just part of our love, too. I think it's really cool that individual get to, you know, really show off their personality aside from what Freyvana stands for, which is, you know, a really cool brand. But I think it's really cool that, you know, for example, Josh is his own, you know, own personality. I know Ricky also has, you know, some really fun fun content. So I think it's, uh, I think it's awesome that you guys are giving individual a voice to be able to highlight them, you know, in addition to like wait for what Freyvana is. Yeah, it's important. I think, I think it'll help grow them too. Um, right, I think if you want to talk about new challenges for your people. That's another way that they can learn and grow and create their own connections. And I think being empowered is, is, is pretty cool and being able to create an environment where people can learn and grow and have their own connections and, create their own relationships as opposed to looking at it as a negative. I think, you know, we've kind of flipped that script and we're like, no, that's, that's a positive. And, you know, I think for everything to be fearful of there, there's always opportunities to kind of change the game. And that's just another area that we've tried to do it. I love that. I think that, you know, again, it kind of like comes back to maybe the transparency, uh, you know, factor that we talked about earlier. I think it's not just, you know, transparency in terms of freights to, to carriers, to shippers, but maybe it's like just, transparency in terms of like company building and be able to like culture transparency. Yeah. Let people see a piece of, you know, what, what, what it looks like on the inside. Well, I've said this before, right? Like a lot of people say, let's take obligatory stuff. Hey, here, you're going to grow here. You're going to leave here. We're going to empower you. And then you're two months into the job, six months into the job, you go ask those same people like, Hey, how would you rank the company? Well, I'll tell you one thing. Most big companies don't do. They never ask you that question. There's no follow up to be like, Hey, does this live up to everything we sold from the recruiting team? And so there's just this natural break point. But then honestly, as a corporation, like, do you think the people don't talk about that? Do you think they don't feel that they don't they, like they're not aware of it? Like, no, of course they do. Right. And so being able to sell a product that is very like on point with what it actually is, I'd rather have that all day. And honestly, we've got people that come in that maybe want something different. They're not a good fit, whatever. That's fine. But if you come in, you know what you get. We kind of lead with our chins. And hey, you could go ask and you probably see it in all our people. Like we do interviews and they're like, hey, what's this? Like, hey, which person do you want to talk to? Like, you, we'll set up 15 minutes. You guys can go rap about it. Like, they're like, wait, sure any anybody, that. right? It's like, yeah, you can go talk to anybody you want. Like, like that's that's our teams. That's our that's their experience. And hopefully it's a positive one. We're assuming it is, but you can get anybody's feedback you want anytime. You're not just our recruiters. Love it. Shannon, what has been, what has been some of the biggest surprise that you've had since building Freyvana? Obviously, I know there's you know surprises every day, but you know if you yeah. were to look look back a little bit, take take a moment to think about it. What really surprised you during this journey so far? I think even if you're really confident, Kevin, you've got all the experience we talked about, you've got a great team. I mean, there's just constant like in your head, you're always in your head about what you're doing, what you're not doing, you're, you're battling self doubt, like you're just being a human, right. And um, I think I knew I was putting all the chips on the line, but I just didn't think like, how much like thought and like really working through just keeping yourself in a mentally positive state when you have losses when you you know what I mean, and really figuring out like, how to make sure you've prepared yourself mentally for the journey that is startup life, right? Because even all the advantages, all the position, all the partnerships, right? Like it's, it's, there's no roses and rainbows. Um, you don't see about that in our marketing, right? Like we, we don't talk about numbers and sales goals and growth. And I think honestly, you're going to see an industry that, that probably is a little quiet on that for the next uh, 12 to 24 months for obvious reasons. But for us, it's just not in our DNA. It wasn't even from the get go. And so, just really, I think just being able to put yourself in a mentally good spot, um, 
but honestly quitting that job, my, my prior job and, and having a chance to just reset everything in my life and really just take some inventory, I'd say personally, professionally, the relationships, the friendships, the people that matter, like it really gave me a good opportunity at this age for me to just really kind of reset on multiple levels and going into the journey was more about the business. I didn't realize how much was going to come from the personal journey. And I guess that's my biggest takeaway. Were there moments of self doubt? Were were there moments you were just like, I don't know if this is a good idea. I, I don't know if I can do this all the time, all the time all the time right and all the time right all the time you're you're constantly battling that um but that's what's cool to have a good good team and when you're having a bad day you got someone to lean on when you get bad news there's always good news around the corner and so uh, self-doubt's a huge thing i don't care how you show up what you pretend like there's always questions and if you don't have questions then then you're, you're kind of unaware and i'd rather always have the doubt than just be completely unaware so um it's it's always prevalent i would tell you um, very much, I feel very much the same way. I, I think it's very easy to portrait, you know, the success of a company on, on just kind of like the shiny, the, the highlights on social media, on, on, you know, articles that, you know, press articles about you. But I think there's a lot more that you have to deal with as a founder that is really just like behind the scene, you may, you know, like all the pain, all the twists and turns that, that really happens behind all the kind of like the, the shiny, you know, like, um, cover that 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 people see so i think i really appreciate you sharing that and and i think it's definitely especially as a leader as a founder of the company i think you're shouldering a lot and being able to have people that you know like people that you trust people on your team that you trust and you can have an outlet to i think that is so 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 crucial yeah and the highlight there too i tell you there's so many intricacies of a business when you run it at a big institution even though you're running big business you're not running the depths all the way down to like healthcare decisions and right like Techno- every minute technology decision and AP and AR, like when you go do this, you're responsible for the whole rack. And technically you are at a big company, but you've got this massive system that's set up with many pros and many uh, a piece of that that already been figured out. And when you do startup, you literally have to figure out every single incremental one, which is incredibly unique. 100%. Um, Shannon, uh, as we are getting to a closing, I'm curious um, for you along your, you know, like, 10 plus years of a uh, journey, you know, in yeah. trade. Well, who are some of the most influential mentors that you've met that have really, you know, shape you in a, in a, um, into like who you are today? Yeah. I've got friends like honestly all over the industry. I think, I think, you know, I look out, I've watched guys like a Matt Pyatt at arrive, right. Go from his early periods of time and build something special. Um, I've got friendships through certain vendors. Um, introduced to founders that now have $2 billion companies. Um, also, honestly, in my asset-based role, have, have a really solid group of guys that run logistics companies and asset-based companies that I've leaned on for question. We lean on each other, right? About vendors, about learnings, about teams, about what's happening in the industry, rules, regulations. And so, so many folks that have helped uh, me build that, right? You got to realize I grew up in a, an environment at Night Swift asset-based trucking, there wasn't a lot of non-asset logistics professionals there. So most of my learnings, experiences, technology, any of the moving pieces, I had to go out and kind of seek that from the outside world. And so I think I was in a different spot than most folks in a prior organization, but it forced me to go learn and create relationships. And and those relationships, even today, right? Uh, great friendships throughout throughout the industry that I can lean on. And, and, they, and they call me too for questions and advice. Um, and I try to help them where I can. Um, although many of them are like established, you know, companies making all kinds of profit doing their things. And I'm, I'm still trying to figure it out, but we have a mutual level of respect and, and, and they're super supportive in that, which I think has been the cool part too, right? You realize it's a big ocean and, and the best of folks I think in the industry are supporting one another. Um, realizing that even as competitors, like we can still win. I, I mean, that is, I was on a customer call the other day with technically a competitor that set us up on the call with the partner, right? Because of some trailers and stuff. And I'm like, how cool is that? Right? Like he could have looked at it and he even said like, Hey, I know that technically you're a competitor, but let's get this thing going. And I'm like, man, those are cool relationships, right? That's cool. When he realizes where we're at, he realized, yes, we are a competitor, but he's willing to set us. And like, I was on the call with him and the customer talking about opportunities and he was cool with it. He was happy about it. I'm like, that's pretty rad when you've developed relationships like that. Absolutely. I think it's, we're all running our own race 
And, and I think it's really cool to see, to find the people that really see it as a positive, uh, positive sum game. Uh, and, you know, kind of like the, the competitors that you talk about, because I think at the end of the day, you know, like, I think Frey is a huge industry. Probably not any one of us, is, you know, will be able to conquer that whole, what it, what is it, $800 billion of it. Whatever so I think, number you, know, you want to throw, yeah. Yeah, so I think, you know, really be able to have that mindset, hey, like we're all here together, trying to make a positive change in this industry. I think that's a really powerful mindset. And I think that's like, the type of people that I want, you know, surround myself with. So, and I think, you know, I definitely see you as one of those people. So I really appreciate, you know, like our, um, you know, interaction so far and you being here today. Um, I just have one final question for you. And okay. this is my final question. Um, final, 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 final. Don't go Barbara Walters on me. Kevin. <laughs> given, given, all the, given, Sorry. given everything, you, given everything you've done, given all the success that you, you know, you've seen so far at your, uh, you know, in terms of your career. How much of how much of it would you attribute to hard work, and how much you, how much of it would you attribute to to luck? Oh, I'd say I'd say grit, grit sixty five seventy, and and luck probably 30, 25, 30. I think I've just always been someone willing to 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 outwork someone. I care a lot about whatever game I'm playing. Right, it, it it's a gift and a curse. Right, it, I'd be the the guy diving for balls in a, a city league pas- basketball game and people are like, what on earth are you doing? And I'm like, Oh, isn't, I thought the mission was to win, right? Like win at all costs. Right. And so like, I've always been wired like that. And so for me, I think that grit going back to that underdog mentality, like that's, that's what I give um, in sport. That's what I give in profession. That's what I, I, I you know, and I think, you know, you got to curtail that at times because it works against you. But more times than not, what I found is it creates immense opportunities, allows me to kind of um, take my game to the next level. And quite honestly, you know, to your point, that's that's why I've, we've got dozens and dozens and dozens of people on this journey, because I think when they see someone that's willing to go that fire with them, like that's someone people will go will go to war with. Uh, we'll go to work with, we'll, we'll commit their most valuable resource, their time to. And so uh, I show up in a way that's, that's very like, Hey, I'm in the trench with you and um, willing to do anything for us to win as a team. And I think that's, that's been the key to my success. hundred percent. That's all I got for you today, Shannon, Shannon I'm- Green, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. And I wish you all the best and wish you and the Frey Vano team all the best in terms of, you know, building, um Freyvana into the vision that you have and I hope I can you know keep being a supporter of whatever you're doing and uh super excited to see what's to come okay well you, you just you, you know we came up with an official Freyvana sign you know you, you could you could throw it up you just it's a little challenging right you've got to you got to kind of figure it out yeah exactly okay yeah am I doing then it right you, yeah you kind of you almost got it yeah it's it's a little challenging you'll figure it out but you, you, you gotta get that F's gotta come in a little bit on that. No, the other way. This way? This way?